Hello everyone. Now then, what would you say if I told you that I knew of a very generous Nigerian prince who needed your help to move his vast riches out of his country? Or what if I told you I could sell you a magic brain pill that will make you smarter? Or how about this one? What if I told you that I could teach you an entire college course in just five minutes? How would you like to learn a lot in a short amount of time? A major infusion of knowledge in, say, five minutes? And what if those five minutes distilled the best ideas from some of the best minds in the world? Just as a shot of espresso boosts your energy, a shot of Prager University boosts your brain. Because not only will you have more knowledge, you will have more wisdom. If you think I'm exaggerating, there's an easy way to find out. Just watch a course. That is Dennis Prager there, in a video titled, Welcome Prager University. That's right, Prager University is an online university. Now, I know it looks like just a YouTube channel and not a university, but it is. It is a university, and I know the quote, courses look like YouTube videos, but they're not. They're real university courses taught by some of the quote, best minds in the world. You can tell this because they come with study guides. For example, here's the study guide for the video Feminism 2.0, which has sections to be filled in during and after watching the video, discussion and review questions, and a quiz with questions like, it is easy for feminists to forget that men, A, gave women the right to vote, B, gave up their monopoly on political power, C, invented birth control, and D, all of the above. Their answer, of course, being all of the above. Now, the horrible reality suggested by these study guides is that there is someone somewhere in the world homeschooling their children using these videos and, like, quizzing them on them afterwards, which, you know, doesn't even bear thinking about, really, does it? So, okay, Prager University is not a university. It's not an academic institution of any kind, actually. It is a YouTube channel created by conservative talk show host Dennis Prager and funded by the billionaire businessmen the Wilkes Brothers, who got rich by creating a hydraulic fracking company called Frack Tech. Seriously. So when you see Prager U videos with titles like Why You Should Love Fossil Fuel, well, that's why. Now, the Wilkes brothers also donate huge amounts of money to conservative politicians, such as when they gave $15 million to a super PAC backing Ted Cruz in 2015. So when you see PragerU videos with titles like Money in Politics, What's the Problem? Well, that's why. Now, I feel like I've came out a little harshly here. It'd be unfair at this point, to just dismiss the whole channel as a biased conservative fantasy project funded by two oil billionaires. So, let's back up a bit. Uh, why am I talking about PragerU today? Well, you, like me, may have noticed PragerU's videos being promoted all over YouTube, including sometimes on videos of mine and my lefty pals. Now, that's because PragerU has an enormous annual budget and spends a large proportion of that on advertising itself. Anyway, I had mostly ignored these advertisements until fairly recently, when via a series of tragic misclicks I ended up on this video, Who Needs Feminism? Featuring speaker Andrew Claven, which begins with Andrew Claven stating, I am an anti-feminist. And let me show you what I saw after that. Feminism denigrates masculinity in men by relentlessly calling us toxic for our flaws, rather than appreciating our natural qualities of energy, risk-taking, and leadership. But it also denigrates femininity in women, working to replace most women's commitment to relationship and child-rearing with male obsessions, such as career status and strength. What's the result? Take a look at the quintessential feminist icon, Rosie the Riveter, flexing her muscle. The truth is, any man of the same size and fitness can make a bigger, stronger muscle than Rosie can. Now, I feel like I could write a whole dissertation on the problems with these two paragraphs here, but I'll just read through them now quickly and try to give you the short version. So, here we go. Feminism denigrates masculinity in men. Now, hold on. Uh, here's the first problem. No, it doesn't. Feminism doesn't do anything independently. It's not a monster that lives in a cave somewhere plotting against men. You know, one person calling themselves a feminist might do that, but other people calling themselves feminists will not. Feminism is an idea, 
with different interpretations. It has no individual agency of its own, and there's no supreme leader of feminism who sets the official feminism agenda. Anyway, uh, sorry, short version, right? Feminism denigrates masculinity in men by relentlessly calling us toxic for our flaws rather than appreciating our natural qualities of energy risk-taking and leadership. So, you know, woe is me. People are saying men are bad instead of saying they're good. How unfair. But it also denigrates femininity in women, working to replace most women's commitment to relationship and child-rearing with male obsessions such as career status and strength. Now again, feminism doesn't actually do either of those things. What most feminists would probably take issue with in these two sentences is Andrew Claven claiming abstract concepts like energy are a natural quality of just one sex, which doesn't really make any sense, but whatever, let's get to the fun bit here. Now then, uh, what's all this about? What's the result of what? Feminism? Feminism's denigration of the sexes, I guess. So, okay, the result of that is Rosie the Riveter flexing her muscle there. But the truth is, the truth is, men have bigger muscles than the cartoon lady and could beat her at an arm wrestling competition should one happen to break out, I suppose. So the consequence of this malicious, sentient form of feminism is that women today can be misled by World War II-era inspirational work posters into falsely believing that they could beat men in an arm wrestling competition. Is that right there? Have I got that? So anyway, since Prager you brought it up, uh, let's talk about Rosie the Riveter. Now, Rosie the Riveter was a World War II cultural icon, not designed, you might be surprised to hear, to convey women's muscular superiority to men, but as one of many government morale-boosting campaigns aimed at encouraging women in the workforce, particularly women working in what were traditionally considered male roles. Now, why, you might ask, did the government want to encourage women to join the workforce? Was it as part of some evil feminist campaign to attack masculinity and erode femininity? Well, no. You see, during World War II, there was a labour shortage, because a lot of the men had been conscripted into the armed forces, and so increasingly, job openings in factories and the likes were filled by women. Women were encouraged to join the workforce to aid the war effort. That's why that was happening. You know, we can do it, as in win the war. Not like overthrow men with our superior biceps or something. And I would have liked to see Andrew Claven try to defend his ideas during World War II, you know, women shouldn't be working in factories. That's a male job. They should be home looking after the kids and being all feminine. And it's like, stop whining, Andrew. We've got to beat the Nazis here. There's no time for all your gender rubbish. So anyway, I was sufficiently blown away by this particular video that I decided to watch a few more. And here's my first impression of the channel. A Prager use boast of only needing five minutes to convey its ideas to you is actually being a little too generous there. I can tell you basically everything PragerU has to offer in a fraction of that time. So here goes. Firstly, feminism and other social justice causes are completely unnecessary, right up until the point at which we all agree they did something necessary, in which case the credit should go instead to Christian white men for allowing it to happen. Secondly, capitalism is great and has absolutely no downsides, brackets, except for all the downsides, which are actually the result of us not doing capitalism hard enough. Thirdly, no, that's about it, really. What did that take? 30 seconds? Now, to be fair, a few videos do fall outside those parameters there, but those two things are their bread and butter. Christian white men and capitalism are always good, Anyone who questions either of those things is always bad. And what I'm going to do now is take a look at how PragerU expresses those ideas and see how fairly they represent any counter-arguments. And not to give the game away here, but I did title my video How PragerU Lies to You. So, okay, first up is How PragerU Lies to You About Feminism. And we'll stick with Andrew Claven's video Who Needs Feminism here for a little while. And let's read a little of the script. Now, perhaps you'll protest. Isn't feminism simply the idea that women have the same human rights as men? No, it isn't. That philosophy is called classical liberalism. 
which holds that we are all equally endowed by God with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, this is just basic misrepresentation. Clavin anticipates the fact that he'll be called out on his biased definition of feminism, and his answer to a hypothetical person presenting an alternative interpretation is, no. No. You're wrong. I'm right. Only my definition is right, not yours. So there. Which is not exactly advanced debate tactics, is it? Clavin's only offered evidence to feminism not being about equality of the sexes is that he claims that philosophy is called classical liberalism, which is silly all on its own, uh, but implicit here is that a single idea cannot be shared between two political philosophies, which is ridiculous, obviously. Feminism could be about equality, and also classical liberalism could be about equality, because equality is not an idea that is singular to any one particular political movement. Later in his video, Clavin states, Feminism has developed the historical mythology that men have oppressed women and now must be suppressed in their turn to even things out. Uh, more misrepresentation here. I'd just like to point out that not once in this video does Andrew Clavin quote a feminist or cite any particular feminist theory or literature, and this should be a red flag. Speaking personally here, I have never met any feminist who claims feminism is about suppressing men to even things out. Mainly, I've met feminists who say feminism is about equality, but apparently they were all secretly classical liberalists or something. Andrew Claven here is arguing against a straw man version of feminism that only exists within the confines of his own imagination. He doesn't name who he's talking about either because they don't exist and he's just making it up, or because he's scared he'll get a response from an actual, real person with realistic ideas, and they're a lot harder to argue with than cartoon characters. Uh, speaking of arguing with cartoon characters, in their video Who Killed the Liberal Arts, which is one of many PragerU videos complaining about modern university campuses, uh, we can see the following. There's some little cartoon professors there saying, we repudiate the great humanist tradition on which much of Western civilization and the Western university has been built. What a foolishly self-defeating quote there from anonymous cartoon professor number two. And later in the video, the cartoon professor really gives the game away when they say, I seek only to confirm my own worldview. It's quite a candid confession there, and it's handy these cartoon professors are so forward with their hypocrisies, isn't it? You know, given we've only got five minutes to argue against them. Uh, returning to feminism here, I'd like to use two PragerU videos now to highlight a favourite little conservative contradiction of mine, and we're going to look first at a video about the employment system, and then a video about the education system, and pay particular attention to how gendered differences are described and accounted for. So first up is the video, There Is No Gender Wage Gap, narrated by Christina Hoff Sommers, which comes to the conclusion that there is a gender wage gap. Let's take a look. Even a study by the American Association of University Women, a feminist organization, shows that the actual wage gap shrinks to only 6.6 .6 cents when you factor in different choices men and women make. And the key word here is choice. The small wage gap that does exist has nothing to do with paying women less, let alone with sexism. It has to do with differences in individual career choices that men and women make. So okay, there is a gender wage gap despite the title of the video, but it's okay, because the gap is accounted for by the different choices that men and women make. Men and women are just fundamentally different and choose different careers, and the result of the sum of those individual choices is that men get paid more. Changing the system to enforce equality here is entirely unnecessary. The system itself is neutral, and the discrepancy in outcomes is only down to individual choice. Right. So on to video two, titled War on Boys, also narrated by Christina Hoff Sommers. And let's take a look at that. Being a normal boy is a serious liability in today's classroom. Compared with girls, boys earn lower grades, they win fewer honors, they're far less likely to go to college. Boys are languishing academically while girls are prospering. In an ever more knowledge-based economy, this is not a recipe for a successful society. We need to start thinking about how we can make our grade school classrooms 
more boy friendly. We need to reverse the boy averse trends. Male underachievement is everyone's concern. Now I'm not sure I need to go through the second half of this argument here. I assume most of you have probably got it already, but uh, for the one of you who missed it, here's the contradiction. When women are lagging behind men, for example in the wages they get paid, this is no problem whatsoever, it's just a natural result of men and women's biological differences. But when men are lagging behind women, such as receiving lower grades in school, well that's everyone's concern. And we need to institute system-wide reforms in order to reverse the trend. And I like how biology is used here, it's presented as both the reason to preserve a system when men are ahead, and also as the reverse to reform a system when men are behind. The message seems to be that any societal system should cater to male biological traits, or at least conservatives' estimation of what male biological traits are. And we can have some fun here by reversing the argument in favour of girls, and maybe come up with some of our own flimsy evolutionary psychology too. So, okay, girls do better in schools, but that's fine. Whatever gap there is between boys and girls is entirely accounted for by the different choices they make. Girls are good listeners, good communicators, they're better at multitasking. This is just natural. If boys choose to spend their time playing outside instead of studying, then they're free to do that, but it would be unfair to expect equal grades for it. Anyway, uh, let's move on now and examine PragerU's presentation of capitalism, which is a frequent topic in videos like If You Hate Poverty, You Should Love Capitalism, Why You Love Capitalism, Is Capitalism Moral, Why Capitalism Works, and so on. Now, in these videos and others, PragerU presents a well, literally cartoonishly simple version of capitalism. Uh, let's take a look at the video Why Capitalism Works, which seeks to explain the basics of how businesses operate under capitalism. Now, they use the example of a flower shop. A newly opened flower shop can be run in different ways, you see. A selfish shop owner will put their needs before that of the customer, and thus will not make any profits. Only businesses that satisfy their customers will succeed. Under capitalism, a business prospers only if customers voluntarily trade for its output. Now, the majority of the time, this is how PragerU talks about capitalism. It's little cartoon people bumbling around making cute, mutually beneficial transactions. You know, I have a quantity of money, a store has a product I desire, we trade those things and both profit. Hurrah. So what do we think about this? Well, first off, I'd like to highlight that they chose a flower store for their example, rather than say, a weapons developer, or a predatory loan lender, or a fracking company, say. Uh, but since they picked a flower store, uh, let's talk about that. So some flower stores are good and successful, and some flower stores are selfish and unsuccessful. They each make a series of mutually beneficial trades with customers, and naturally the successful stores do better than the unsuccessful ones, and... What? The end? You know, we restart the simulation tomorrow? Uh, no, in actual reality, things continue happening after that, so let's carry on with the example. Uh, the successful flower store, after all their transactions, has built up some wealth. And if they build up enough wealth, they can start to influence the market outside of those simple customer-level transactions. Let's say they purchase the unsuccessful flower store, and several others, and unite them all under the same brand. So now you've got Flower Corp. Now Flower Corp, being a big business, will be sought after for big contracts. There will be competition to be the supplier of seeds, say, to Flower Corp. Flower Corp will be able to use its large market share as leverage to make beneficial deals with its suppliers, which will then mean they can cut costs on the consumer end, perhaps lower than it's possible for any startup business to compete with. This is one reason why big box stores kill off small local businesses, as well as, you know, convenience. They can afford to sell for less because they buy for less because they buy in bulk. So Flower Corp starts pricing flower startups out of the market, and just to be sure, maybe they open a Flower Corp store nearby any new flower businesses to divide their sales. Now, let's see how far this metaphor can be stretched here. Let's say Flower Corp starts lobbying politicians to relax flower industry regulations and cut flower industry taxes. 
and pretty soon half the Senate is in the pocket of Big Flower. Let's say Flower Corp becomes so powerful that they're able to insert their executives into the staff of many of the country's most powerful politicians. Let's imagine their CEO becomes Vice President, even, and starts pushing for a war with the Netherlands in order to install a puppet government that will give their country cheap deals and all those fancy tulips they've got. Let's say a whole speculative flower market opens up, massively inflating the price of flowers until they cost more than a house. And a quick editorial note here, this one has actually happened in reality. And let's say that Flower Corp becomes so large that it becomes too big to fail, so that when the flower bubble finally bursts, the government will step in and bail them out with public money. The government is staffed with their executives and funded by their lobbyists, after all. And finally, let's say that public opinion starts turning against Flower Corp and its various shady dealings, and more generally against the flawed system that allowed Flower Corp to cause so much damage. So, Flower Corp decides to fund a YouTube channel hosting videos that explain how they're actually great and can do no wrong. And there we are there, we've caught back up to the present day. So, that's the saga of Flower Corp there. Now, in reality, all of those actions were carried out by the defence, oil and financial industries, not the flower industry. Uh, but how does PragerU, you might be wondering, account for all of those terrible happenings? They were all a result of capitalist institutions acting in their own self-interest, trying to increase their own profits, which is supposed to be beneficial for everyone, right? Uh, so let's introduce the conservative cop-out answer for explaining away all the problems of capitalism. Crony capitalism. What is it? Why is it so bad? To answer these questions, let's think about good old-fashioned capitalism. It is premised on the free exchange of goods or services between independent agents. Capitalism is moral because it is premised on a voluntary exchange between independent parties who agree to the deal only because it creates value for everybody. Crony capitalism is immoral because one of the parties, the government, has been bought off. Now, here I'd just like to remind you of this video I showed earlier. Money in politics, what's the problem? Well, here you go, PragerU, you've discovered it. So, crony capitalism, then. This is a concept PragerU talks about a few times, and always in a particularly biased way. As you'll see, the government is always to blame. So, crony capitalism is unfair and immoral, because the government has been bought off. But by who, though, you might be wondering? Well, private interests. Should they share any of the blame? Well, let's watch a brief clip from their video, The Speech Every 2015 College Grad Needs to Hear. Washington has produced a bubble in higher education just the way it produced the bubble in housing. Some government planners decided that too few people owned homes. So the planners decided to force an increase in home ownership. They lowered lending standards for people seeking a mortgage. This produced a glut of subprime loans and subprime borrowers, and then a crash. So that was the housing market crash according to PragerU there. And let's just read through that one more time. Washington has produced a bubble in higher education just the way it produced a bubble in housing. Some government planners decided that too few people owned homes, so the planners decided to force an increase in home ownership. Now, absent here is any mention of lobbying, naturally, just silly government officials doing silly, nonsense things for no reason. They lowered lending standards for people seeking a mortgage. And side note, we call that deregulation, which we're not allowed to say is a bad thing, so we have to call it something else, like lowered lending standards instead. This produced a glut of subprime loans and subprime borrowers, and then a crash. So... This produced a glut of subprime loans. From who, though? Did they spring forth from the earth? No, it was private institutions, who are again being presented as blameless here. Only the government is at fault for not preventing the ill effects of the greed of the private sector. Greed which is excusable, because working in your own self-interest is always good, uh, unless you're a politician approached by a lobbyist with a suitcase full of money, of course, in which case you're expected to ignore your own self-interest and only consider the public good. This is a racket. 
Capitalism is always perfect, except for when it isn't, in which case it was the government's fault for not stopping it. And PragerU's solution to this problem is equally nonsensical. You see, according to them, the private sector only lobbies and influences the government into doing bad things because the government is so big and powerful. If we limit the government, then they won't want to control it as much, apparently. Which is a bit like saying, if we just let the foxes into the hen house, think of the money we'll save on fencing. Now, I'm going to close out soon, but I can't go without giving a special mention to PragerU's use of graphs to illustrate their points. We've already seen this one from the video Why Capitalism Works, which is almost nonsense if you look at it for more than five seconds. Uh, here's another good one from their video Make Men Masculine Again, showing the masculine turning into the feminine over time, distance, temperature, <laughs> who knows? Uh, this one's from their video Blacks in Power Don't Empower Blacks, uh, which apparently shows labour participation rates, but doesn't. You know, these are just two orange rectangles. There's no values on them. This one is from their video, Why is Modern Art So Bad?, showing the, quote, decline of artistic standards. Now, the vertical axis is at least labelled here, with standards, which are measurable, apparently, uh, and they peaked just after 1850, and then declined until about 1970 there, until there were no more standards. There are no artistic standards anymore, whatsoever. Uh, there's this one from their video Hoover and the Great Depression, which shows industry uh, with the economy lurking in the background there. And this one has two labels, uh, wage rates, which are going down as layoffs are going up and getting dangerously close to that dark cloud there. I don't know what that's meant to signify, but it can't be good. Earlier in that video, we see this graph, uh, prices for industrial goods, which started out in 1929 at nearly three dollar signs there. Uh, then prices fell to just two dollar signs throughout 1930, holding steady just long enough to underline the words economy-wide deflation, uh, which is handy. Uh, after that, there's more bad news, I'm afraid, with prices falling yet again, threatening to reach just one dollar sign, which as we know is the lowest possible price. Now, anyone can make rubbish like this. I mean, look, here's one I made, for instance. What does this show? Happiness increasing as number of feminists increases, I guess. Now, does this prove anything, this graph? And I'd just like to reiterate to any fans of PragerU who might be watching now, uh, this is made up. Remember, I made this. Don't go around citing this. Now, you might say, Sean, picking on PragerU's graphs is unfair. They're not supposed to be real academic graphs. They're just little visual aids to complement what the speaker is talking about. They're not peer-reviewed or anything. And I would say to that, exactly, they're not real academic graphs. Because this isn't a real academic institution. It's a YouTube channel. It can call itself whatever it likes, but a university, it is not. Thanks a lot for watching, everyone. I might come back to PragerU at some point. A few of their videos seem possibly worthy of a more in-depth look, so we'll see about that. Let me know in the comments. Just kidding. I never read the comments. I'm not a masochist. Uh, I do read my Curious Cat questions, though, if you'd like to ask me a question on there. Now, before I go, I should mention here a couple of things that PragerU got right. Uh, their video, Was the Civil War About Slavery?, is actually not bad they do not come to the conclusion that you would expect them to come to. Also, PragerU get points from me for arguing against bailing out failing financial institutions, which I saw them do in a couple of videos. A lot of the time, conservatives will go on about the brilliant competition of the free market, and then defend propping up failing banks with public money or something. It's highly hypocritical there. So credit to PragerU for avoiding doing that. Uh, thanks as always to all my Patreon backers for supporting me in making videos like this. A link to my Patreon page is below if you'd like to check that out. Right, thanks folks, I'll see you next time.